Hello. Thank you so much for welcoming me. I'm very excited to present to you some of the few advantages that diode lasers have to offer as it pertains to non-malignant lesions in pain therapy as an ablative and as a therapeutic adjunct to periodontal treatment. I'd like to begin by saying thank you for inviting me to come present to your, to your study club. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak alongside some of the top educators in the world. There are some elite educators here and I feel extremely privileged to be welcome on this platform. So thank you so much for inviting me. Let me preface this by saying there are many different lasers on the market. These are some of the most common lasers on the dental market here in the States. For purposes of this course, we are going to focus on the second tier of lasers, which are diode or soft tissue lasers. However, I would invite you to explore the many uses of all tissue lasers in the realm of periodontics, endodontics, sleep apnea, and so much more. If you're using a diode laser, there are several different treatments that you can do. These fall under a category of ablatives, better known as restorative therapies versus surgical. And if you're a hygienist or a dental therapist using lasers, these are some of the common treatments that you can perform depending on what type of diode or which model you're using. So in this course later on, we will talk about laser bacterial reduction and laser assisted SRPs. But I'd have you guys take a picture of this slide. And I would like for you to take a picture of this slide. I'll pause and hold because we may do a little activity down the line. You may have an opportunity to book a session with me where I can help you go through a list of treatments that you can perform and incorporate into your practice. Did you grab that photo? Good. Here you go. Go ahead and take your camera out. Snap a photo there. Perfect. So in this course, we're going to break it down into three segments. So first, we're going to look at the class of the general classification of lasers and how we break them down into treatment application, how we use them as therapeutics. Then we're going to look at lasers, how we specifically use them mechanically to treat lesions, remove lesions, and enhance periotherapy. And then as we wrap up, I'd like to touch on how we can shift the mindset of the patient and really enhance the brand of the practice by using this high level advanced technology. I'm Elaine Rodriguez, owner, founder, and director of education of dental laser integrations, where we specialize on top tier laser education for the entire team. Before this, I was a clinical hygienist for almost 10 years, working in many different types of practices, but primarily in a single doctor practice where I was the main hygienist working with patients day in and day out using lasers and other adjunctive therapies. We saw many different types of patients from newborns to geriatrics. So I had a very rich experience of working with all types of patients. Before that, I actually was an assistant to a prosthodontist, the denture doctor, which actually sparked my love of preventative hygiene and wanting to go in to do better care for our patients. So let's look at how lasers are going to benefit with what we're doing now. So historically, if you look at the history, there are many uses of light that our ancestors have used from the beginning of time. So in 1903, we saw that Finson won a prize for treating common skin conditions that were very painful. So there's no question as to the healing power of light and what it can do as a natural therapy. When we see this question, I'm talking to a group of professionals, high level professionals, but Think about if we were talking to a patient, how would we answer this question? 
So we can get technical and say, technically, laser is a beam of radiant light. We know many different beams of light come from the sun. But a more appropriate way to refer to the patient is it's a natural light, it's a natural treatment. So we know laser as amplified light. There is a form of radiation, but as we'll learn later, it's non-radiation. So when we look at lasers, we classify them by the measurement of their wavelength, their nanometer. So here's a nice graph of all the various lasers that are on the dental market. Of course, we're gonna be looking primarily here at the diodes. And we break the physics of the edu laser education into three segments. We look at what is the wavelength that will relate to how deep does it absorb or penetrate the tissue. And then we look at where does it fall on the color spectrum? Where does it fall on the electromagnetic spectrum? Can we see it or can we not? So further, this is a nice overview of the various depths of absorption of laser therapy. So we see diode nice and starred because it's very important to note that diode laser energy has optimal absorption in the nerve vasculature, in the blood supply. So when we look at the classification of lasers, we go by their name, common, common name, what powers them. We give them a range or a family. We put them in a category of wavelengths. So the way we read this is diode lasers operate on a solid active medium. Its wavelengths measure from 810 to 1064 nanometers, and they're attracted to melanins and hemoglobins. They're best absorbed in tissue that contains melanin and hemoglobin. Now, if we were looking down the line, we can guess that these bottom listed are hard tissue laser, all tissue lasers, because this signifies that the light absorbs best in hard tissue. So let's remember what the function of the melanocyte is. It's a protector cell. So we do see it in ethnic patients and in darker skinned individuals, but then we also see it pop up again when there's active infection or disease present. It's also great to note of the job of the hemoglobin. This is directly responsible for helping the body function to bring energy and oxygen to the tissues. So the essence of laser dentistry, of diode laser dentistry is what happens on a cellular level. This is what really allows us to regard laser as a medicine and a therapeutic. So when it comes to diode lasers, it has optimal depth of absorption in the nerve vasculature, causing a, an initial cascade of effects. That initial cascade is what we call photobiomodulation and biostimulation. So it's just scientific terminology, meaning there's a vasodilation that happens. There's an absorption within the cell or the cell's key player, which is the ATP center of the cell. And what the patient feels and sees or experiences is the clinical effect or the secondary effect, which is improved healing, pain relief, desensitization, if you will. So because this is amplified light, the electricity also has an, a hand in stimulating blood flow and those initial anti-inflammatory mediators through the tissue. So looking at this, we know laser has optimal absorption. It has a penetrative power because it is amplified light. It does perform something called photobiomodulation. So further, what happens when laser absorbs into the key components of the gingival structure? So we think back to what is the job of a macrophage, uh, red blood cells, white blood cells, namely fibroblast, collagen, and elastin. So as you see, we're using laser as a natural topical therapeutic because of its depth of absorption and its ability to stimulate key cells of the tissue for cell turnover, regeneration, and repair. So it's, a good, it's, it's good to notate and just go back and remember the histology 
of what lasers do because I, for one, didn't quite think about it until I went back and started to study more. So I always like to bring this up just to uh, refresh our recollection. So again, just unpacking those scientific terms, light absorbing in living tissue, creating a change. And then we have light absorbing into particular cells. So that's where we see laser absorbing into specific key cells of the gingival structure. So namely, laser, diode lasers are attracted to cells undergoing in inflammation and acidity or oxidative stress. So photobiomodulation means a diode laser is absorbed and attracted to tissue that's going that's infected or inflamed or diseased. So when we use laser in hygienics or periotherapy, our goal is to regenerate long junctional epithelium. So we're directly trying to use this laser to stimulate cell turnover in a fibroblast where we see new attachment or pocket reduction. So in this next section, I'd like to go through a couple of treatments that we use both as an ablative and using laser as a topical medicine. So we'll first go through the top ablatives that you'll see in your practice. Some of them you may not see as often, but now that we have a tool or an instrument or the know-how, we can go ahead and start really getting intentional about screening our patients for these particular treatments. So when it comes to ablative therapy or ablative restorative treatment, let's look at a phrenectomy. We're not gonna dive into a frenum today, but I wanna make a note that this treatment is done in three parts. So number one is we do the, the surgical incision or the cut. Then part two, once you get to the optimal depth of uh, delivery, we look at cauterizing the edges and starting to clean that tissue and really seal it up. Then thirdly, we'll use the light as a topical agent, as a topical therapeutic to, to further enhance the healing create rapid cell turnover so that the patient can experience less post-op pain, less swelling, et cetera. So looking at this, lasers are pretty amazing as an instrument to cut because it's healing and it's creating hemostasis and vasoconstriction as we're actually cutting and treating the patient. So diode lasers are very particular in the way they operate. So when you blacken the laser tip is when it allows you to perform an ablative treatment. Otherwise, you're simply creating a biostimulation effect. So again, we can refer to this as minimally invasive because you may not only need much more than a strong topical to treat these. To treat these. So looking at this, let's imagine that this is our patient. And this actually was an, a, a recare patient of mine. She was about 33 years of age. She was a per working professional. And as I did her assessment, I noticed that she had this fibroma along the lip line. I would, I would blame her occlusion as the main etiology, trauma. But we don't quite know that until we remove it and have it sent out for a biopsy, right? So for her, what I did to present this to her was I first measured it, I photographed it, and then I asked her, does this bother you? How do you feel about this? She was amazed that this is something that we can actually remove and treat. So let's look and see how long it actually takes us. So wouldn't it be great to tell her that all we have to do is paint, paint a little topical on the tissue. We don't even have to numb you with a shot, which is kind of scary to patients. We don't have to numb you with an injectable. We can place a gentle topical agent that will be strong enough to keep you comfortable while we do this restorative treatment. So let's say she agrees, we move forward. We set the laser appropriately. 
The high vac is really important here because it also helps to cool the tissue. One note I wanna make about diode lasers is they're thermal, they do emit heat. So when we learn proper technique and settings, everything we do is to not overheat or over treat the patient. So we're using optimal settings where you just see some minor browning of the tissue. And that's actually more hemostized blood. It's not really uh, char or burning tissue. And there we have a tissue pickup. So that's part one, that's the removal. Now we wanna smooth it out, seal it up, create a, what we call laser band-aid, decontaminate it or disinfect it. Then we go through with the lateral side of the laser fiber, which is less intense than the very tip end, keeping that suction close to seal or cauterize and smooth it out. So basically we're taking this lesion from trauma to almost day 10 healing of what it would be it had we just left it alone to heal on its own. And if you look closely, you can see the coagulum or the hemostyzed blood. So this is another advantage of using a thermal laser its ability to, to coagulate and seal the tissue. So there we have it. Beyond this, we would just place a little vitamin E oil and send that specimen off for biopsy. So the next treatment I wanna present is operculum removal. We see them. And can you think about who would benefit from this? If it's an adult, it's probably somebody who's erupting third molars, usually above the age of 25 to 35. But more than likely, it's going to be a child of maybe 13 to 15 range, depending on um, their eruption patterns or, or their maturity, just their development process. So we usually like to follow this treatment up with a preventative sealant. So usually, you're not just treating the tissue in itself, you're probably using this in conjunction with another broad restorative therapy that you're doing. So making a note that we are cutting through keratinized tissue, so it is gonna take a while. Now, for some of our doctors who are accustomed to electrocautery, this does go much slower than electrocautery, but again, the benefit is it's less traumatic, it actually has laser energy, so it's biostimulating the tissue, and it's less thermal, so it's more, it's, excuse me, it's less invasive than the cautery, electrocautery. So we're done. That was about a minute and a half. Now they're painting a, a solution, which is basically just hydrogen peroxide, so there's many different things you can use post-operatively, I prefer vitamin E oil or coconut oil because we now know that peroxide could potentially inhibit some of the healing mechanisms of the tissue. So as you saw, there was a nice, beautiful result. Tissue was nice and hemostized. So we would very easily and simply be able to lay down a preventative sealant thereafter. So with any laser treatment, it's all about what is it how is the tissue gonna look thereafter and how do we handle that specimen? So one thing to note with the operculectomy, that's not something that we usually send out for biopsy, but this is. So I would recommend if you are incorporating this treatment into your practice, work with the team to set up a protocol to where we know where we're sending out this specimen. We know how long the lab's gonna take for the patho, the patho report and we know how to properly follow up the, with the patient to give them their results. So again, we would treat this in three sections. One, we would do the excision. Two, we would cauterize and, and smooth and clean the tissue. And thirdly, we would do photoball modulation to speed up the healing process. 
So last of our ablatives that we're gonna cover is hemangioma. So patients with ortho or hardware, they tend to get be more so prone to gingival hyperplasias, but of course we do see it in other patients with uh, on certain medications, et cetera. So for this patient, they're never gonna be a one and done treatment. So you may or may not wanna wait till after the brackets are removed. Beyond that, you do a laser gingivectomy or a gingivoplasty. And as you can see, most of the time, these patients suffer from some level of gingival inflammation. So they may, moving forward, be a candidate for more laser treatments. So if you see that trend happening, most patients benefit from one or more treatments at all times. So looking now at laser and how it can be used as a topical medication, as a natural topical light therapy. And this modality may change, the hand pieces may change depending on the type or the model of the laser, diode laser that you're using. So many different diodes come with different apparatus or hand piece. So this is a Thor laser and they're very big and popular with uh, photobiomodulation or photomedicine. So again, the mechanism of action here is we're just shining light into the tissue, allowing for that optimal absorption. The laser biostimulates ATP turnover in the cell, creating rapid cell turnover and therefore rapid healing. So this is what a, a treatment may look like, depending on, again, the handpiece, the style of the of your model of laser. We're just going around, again, for a specific time, a specific distance away from the tissue. So again, we're using red light therapy because we learned earlier, red light absorbs directly into that nerve. So here we have lichen planus. This you may not see as commonly, uh, but just make a note of how long it persists. This is something that we really want to keep a watchful eye on uh, because it is precancerous and it could potentially evolve into a malignancy. So lo let's look at what is the common remedy or treatment for this. Drugs, corticosteroids. So the way we treat is, is typically with a pharmaco agent. So it's nice to be able to tell the patients that we're using a more holistic approach to treat them versus treating them with further medications, which could potentially be the cause or the etiology of that. So anytime you are looking at a study, anytime you're reading through research, I want you to make a skim and make a note of what is the wavelength that's being used. And we remember that diodes fall anywhere from the 600 to the 1000 uh, range, roughly. Then we look at what is the goal of this treatment. So the goal here isn't to cure it because we know there's no cure. The goal is to really arrest it, stop it in its tracks, get the patient out of pain and reduce incidence, right? So we did. So remember, this is usually persistent up to six months to two years. To, so to say that we had healing in two weeks is actually a win. So as we start to look at the therapeutic advantages of laser, we really want to make a note of how do we want this to work? What do we want this laser to do? Xerostomia was one treatment that I wish I could have done more for my patients. So we had one patient, we'll call her Miss Lisa. She was 65 years old. She was on multiple medications. And every time she came in, she presented with a new cavity. She suffered from malnutrition because there were very few things that she can tolerate that didn't burn her tissue. So we weren't we had to be very selective with the fluoride therapy that we used to remineralize the tooth enamel and help fight cavity. We actually had to order bubblegum flavored fluoride for her because that's all she can she could tolerate. So 
looking again at what's causing this, what, how is the patient suffering? What is the impact of that? And as we read through this research again, we look at what are we aiming to do? So here in this particular study, they wanted to see if they can enhance the saliva flow of the patient. And they used a wavelength within the 900 nanometer spectrum. And we want to also look at what is the exposure time? Where did they radiate? And what was the duration of that exposure? And clinically successful. So not only did it stimulate cells, but it also uh, regenerate, created a regenerative effect. So two terms that I teach in my class are repair and regenerate. So depending on where you're lasering or what your what area of the tissue or what condition you're trying to heal or improve or enhance, those two terms are very appropriate, repair, regenerate. So breaking down this study now. So this was transformational. Think to any patient or any family member that you know undergoing chemotherapy. So we do see this condition more commonly in patients with chemo. And in our practice, patients actually come in and they do get complementary laser treatment because we know they're paying a ton of money to afford their cancer therapies um, and their chemotherapies. So that's just another thing that we like to offer our patients who are undergoing that. So again, the goal here was to stimulate pain relief and reduce the incidence. So where we see here, the result was successful. So again, looking at the impact, I, I studied at the Academy of Laser Dentistry one year and there was a wonderful woman who was a cancer survivor. And she shared with us her story that as she was going through her treatments, she did experience oral mucositis and it felt like razor blades in the mouth. So knowing that these patients are, are in palliative care, they're fighting for their lives, we do want to be attuned to the impact of what laser therapy can do to either prevent that or reduce the or reduce the occurrence rate. So outside of this study, there are other studies that show they're now using laser therapy as a pre-prophylactic when they're offering chemotherapy. So it's starting to become standard in some hospitals. So that's something that I would love for you guys to, to do your own research and follow up with. So here's a common one that we might see uh, uh, more so than the others. And this actually is the most common laser, or excuse me, the most common mucosal uh, issue that we'll see. Um, and it's the most, yes, it's the most common condition. And again, um, common treatments are uh, pharmacoagents, non-steroidals. Non and the healing time for this takes seven, almost seven to 14 days. And even thereafter, because there's different stages of this lesion. There's the early stage where they're in pain. And then beyond that, it takes a while for the tissue to heal. So we see the best results when we treat this lesion in the early phases, because we do see the patients get 100% out of pain. So if they come in with that sharp, tingly burning sensation, we can use the laser for at a fixed distance for a fixed amount of time to, to get the result. And, and this is pretty amazing. So again, what are we aiming to do? What's the goal here? The goal is to take the laser and directly aim that gentle energy to alleviate pain, to create an analgesic effect and, and, and create pain relief. Very neat. This is probably one of the first eth ethical dilemmas that we might you know, come across when we start to incorporate more therapy. 
we were taught in school uh, that this is very aggressive. We know that it's very uh, contagious. So it may, be not, it may not be something you want to do, but I will tell you that this is a huge practice builder. We have many patients calling us in on Friday afternoon saying they feel an itch tingle burn coming on and they know that we have the ability to treat them. So comparing what's available on the market, which is again, usually a systemic medication or topical ointments that aren't meant to cure or enhance healing. It's really just meant to numb the patient or get them out of pain. So if you, again, if you catch this in stage one or stage two, highly treatable, highly reversible. If it's already to the bloody blister phase or if it's already partially weepy, partially crusty, probably not gonna get the best benefit. So again, the goal here is to completely reverse the lesion from the vesicle phase to the uh, to healed, to clear healed tissue. And we do, we see very, very good results with this. Again, there's a fixed time, there's fixed energy settings to it, but these treatments are very effective. Patient feels little to no discomfort, so we definitely don't have to utilize any topicals. Uh, really, the only uh, consideration is to have the high vac nearby so that it can also help enhance a cooling mechanism. Because again, these lasers are thermal, and what you see is us absorbing heat into that inflammation tissue. Super neat, right? So in this next section, I'd like to look at how the impact kind of shifts the mindset of the patient. So patients are usually coming to us to get their teeth cleaned. They come to the dentist to get a teeth cleaning, but they don't always come knowing that they're going to get their gums cleaned as well. So there's a huge shift in how we put the focus on clean teeth scaling teeth to actually cleaning gum, scaling or debriding the gum tissues. So of these benefits that we're discussing here, I want you to think what stands out to, to you most? So for me as a preventative oral hygienist, what was important to me being that I had been about maybe two years in my practice before we fully incorporated laser as our number one adjunct in our practice. So we did a lot of arrestin, we did a lot of irrigation, we did a lot of medicaments. Uh, they worked to their full ability, yes. However, patients would come back and they were still bleeding. So innately, I knew there was something more that I can do to better treat the patient, to better treat the tissue. And the old model is perio patients always bleed, where the new model is if my patient is showing signs of active bleeding, I'm going to go ahead and intervene and treat them with an appropriate laser periotherapy. So again, spend a little time talking with your team and looking at what are we using currently to treat biofilm? Could be mechanical debridement, piezoing, cavitroning or physical removal could be uh, we're using oral irrigants or, or an antimicrobial solutions and medicaments. So what are we currently using now and how is it working for our patients? So again, I used a lot of Arrestin. I always get the question of, well, what's the difference between Arrestin and laser? So let's think about the active ingredient. So the active ingredient in Arrestin is minocycline. Again, it is a pharmacoagent and its clinical indication is to inhibit bacterial growth. So it falls under a category of bacteriostatic. Whereas laser, the active ingredient is amplified light. It's amplified light. So the photodynamics of that energy emission is attracted to and absorbs into the inflammatory agents of the gum tissue creating a breakup of the biofilm. Even further, the laser itself, the light beam is absorbing into the cells, stimulating rapid cell turnover. So laser is reparative um, and it's regenerative and it's also bactericidal. 
So looking at this, there are many treatments that we can do with laser. And I would love to have the opportunity to come back and talk to you a little bit more about our use of laser and periimplantitis. But for today, I'd like to focus on just the top two periodontal therapies that we do in our, in our common patients, in, or excuse me, in common uh, patients who have gum disease. So this is one patient that I treated successfully. And as you can see, from January of 2017 to October, look at the, the benefit or the, the regeneration, the clinical, uh, the new attachment, excuse me, that we see. So never before had I seen an eight millimeter become a three. So this was really amazing for me. Now, it's important to notate that not everybody heals the same. Everybody's rate of healing is different depending on their host immunity. So for example, patients who have diabetes or high blood pressure, they definitely don't heal as quickly as somebody who like this patient was overall healthy. She had no comorbidities and, and she was fairly young, okay? It had just been a while since, since she had been in. So as you can see, the soft tissue responds really well to this uh, regenerative laser therapy. So here's another patient that we treated and he's actually a case study. So just a little background on him. He's 28 years old. It had been about nine years since he had been to the dentist and he was ready to get back on track. He was excited to, to come back in and, and get healthy. So remember I asked you to take a picture of those top laser treatments, the doctor treatments and the hygiene treatments. There was a list. So if you did, I want us to play a little game called how many treatments does this patient benefit from? So spend a little time, take a picture of this. And if you'd like to participate and connect with me after, I'll give you my WhatsApp uh, information and you can send me your answer. And let's see um, how you do. So here we start with periodontal therapy. We start with periodontal therapy and this treatment is called laser bacterial reduction. So we're taking a clear tip fiber and we're just gently walking it along the pocket into the sulcus. And we see that it's nicely adapted to the tissue because we see that, that nice blanch of the laser fiber up against the gum. And we want to notate what's happening on a cellular level, photobiomodulation and biostimulation, or a, a more informal way to say is the laser is killing bacteria and stimulating healing. So this is what we see day two. So again, this was a case study and I did select this patient for our learning purposes. I knew that based on this patient's age, based on uh, the conditions that he had no risk factors or no core morbidities, I knew his tissue would heal really nicely and respond really well to this treatment. So even though we only scaled on one side, the side that still has calculus, we see notice, noticeable healing. The tissue looks slightly pinker. And this is day three. This is immediately after we, we cleaned the other side. So again, never before had I seen this level of transformation so quickly in my patients. So histologically, what's healing here is the sulcular epithelium. And I'm sure you would have guessed, we know that epithelium has a better uh, response to treatment, a better, excuse me, faster response to treatment. Um, so we'll look a little bit, uh, we'll look in just a few slides as to what we're doing to specifically treat uh, the long junctional epithelium or the tissue that's at the base of the pocket. So here we have a more advanced case um, and just a little bit of background on this patient. It had been, I want, I want to say five years since he had a dental cleaning, but he was a mouth breather. He was a heavy grinder. He had a retronathic bite 
and he was a intermittent drug user. So he had several comorbidities or several cofactors uh, going for him. So he's one that we would treat with therapeutic scaling and root planing. We would do laser bacterial reduction as the part of his overall perio protocol, non-surgical periodontal therapy. And we do a treatment called sulcular debridement. So we may know this or have heard this as laser curatage or sulcular debridement. Uh, another term uh, that we say is laser degranulation because we are directly removing a buildup of necrotic tissue or scar tissue that builds up along the sulcus wall. So laser physically and mechanically debrides the tissue or deepithelializes, making way for, for a healthy cell turnover and reattachment. So by using the laser bacterial reduction first, that helps stimulate the tissue, stimulate blood flow, and helps basically prime and prep the tissue. Then we use this treatment as a minor ablative. Now, if we were getting more technical, the depth of absorption is less than 100 microns. So in laser dentistry, this isn't termed a surgical procedure. It's non-surgical periotherapy. And postoperatively, because he was uh, an, a more advanced case of perio, we did take the laser one final time along his along the margin with this red light or photobile modulation treatment to further stimulate and enhance healing. And that's something that you see a lot of laser restorative dentists do post extraction post phrenectomy, uh, post implant placement, they're using this uh, or, or even post uh, surgical advanced periotherapy, they're using this to go over wherever they've laid a flap or created a surgical incision uh, with the patient. So, so very neat. So at this point, we might be asking ourselves, is laser right for my practice? Is this something that we should consider investing our time, energy, and our resources in? So what all is entailed with that? So this is a, this I will recommend if you have a larger team, talk to them about it. Let them, let's do some research and see what type of laser we want to invest in, what type of dent, laser dentistry do we want to provide? Diode lasers are a great initial investment. Um, again, I don't sell lasers, um, but I will tell you that most of them in the US, they cost anywhere from $2,500 to $8,000. And there are many laser companies that are running deals for you and really want uh, to help you um, with the investment in that side. Second, secondly, it's not just a monetary investment, it's an investment in time. And there is a huge change that happens in the way we practice. So again, you do want to talk with your team and see if they're going to be committed to using that patient, that laser with every patient, ideally at every visit, wherever is applicable. So I would be remiss if I didn't make a note of what does the, uh, ROI look like. So here's a nice little breakdown or a rough estimate of what most general doctors are charging. And this is even on the low end. And in our practice, we love laser because it is the segue. It is the initial point, uh, touch point of healing. So for example, if I treated a, a patient for desensitization, the next thing I would offer them is fluoride preventative therapy because we want to further enhance helping the patient uh, with their hypersensitivity condition. Again, with uh, TMJ treatment, that's one that's very common now. Uh, if I'm talking to the patient about TMJ or bruxism, the next tier in holistic care would potentially be ortho or um, at the very minimum, uh, having a night guard fabricated for them. 
So as far as restorative treatments, this is uh, again, some very um, low fees. Um, usually it's more on the five, the 500 range for, for phrenectomies and so on. So every doctor I work with, uh, most of them are doing gingivectomy on a daily basis, but they're not charging for them. So I would love to see every, every provider get paid for the value and the services that they provide. So that's one thing to think about. So here's a nice little chart of what our day looks like in our practice. So we work in a state where the doctor does not have to be in physically present in the office when we're treating patients. So as you can see, the doctor's column is empty. He's not there today, which is fine. Um, all of these are patients of record. So in this diagram, all of the coral colored patients are scaling and root planing and all of the yellows are at least maintenance, but everybody is having laser. Everybody's having laser. So if you look at the, the breakdown of the ROI, very quickly, you can see that just by minimally using laser, this isn't everybody's model ideal day, but even on a regular day, say we're seeing eight patients a day, let's say if we're using uh, we're, we're offering this and three patients out of eight say yes, that's an annual boost of 20,000 a year. And then likewise, a general quad of non-surgical periotherapy is anywhere again from 50 to 75 to $200. So at bare minimum, you might be seeing um, a daily boost of a hundred dollars or up to 20,000 a year. So um, again, when we invest in laser, we weren't really looking at our ROI. We were more so driven by how is this going to enhance our, uh, our protocols? How is this going to enhance the healing of the patient? Um, and it's okay to say we want to look at how can we become a more profitable practice. So either way, um, but uh, there is an incidence. So in the States, the CDC in 2012 came out with um, a statistic at least 75% of patients experience some level of gum disease. So that means at least statistically six out of eight patients a day would benefit from some form of laser therapy. And that's just two. So again, I don't have to bombard my day. This is why I love laser because I know that I work in a dental business and I know that I'm a provider and a contributor to that practice. However, I don't have to be highly driven or highly stressed to meet my daily production goal. I can spend my time and I can treat my patients according to what they need uh, by properly presenting the benefits and advantages of these treatments. And in that education, in the doing so, the production follows or the profitability follows. So again, I'm not highly driven by numbers. I know they exist, but I'm more so driven uh, by therapeutics. So looking at the research, this particular study looked at the therapeutic advantage of that cell turnover, the, the regenerative effects that we're talking about in terms of photobiomodulation and biostimulation. So this is one article that I like to show in my laser certification courses. And in this study, they looked at the laser's ability uh, it's bacterial cytal ability. So this uh, particular article showed therapeutic advantage of reducing AA, which as we know, it's the more aggressive anaerobe that lives in the deeper tissues and pockets of, of the patient's gum tissue. And this study discussed the, and, and looked at the potential to stimulate fibroblast. So we're no longer in the dark, so to speak. We're no longer in the dark. There's, there's a lot of research that's available to us. Again, it's just a matter of knowing how to read it, understanding what laser wavelength was used, what was the expected treatment outcome, and, and were we successful? Did we see results? So it's not just enough to, to look at what does the laser do. We want to really be proven by factual and clinical science. So dentists and hygienists are very good at 
uh, being uh, skeptics at heart. And that's fair. That's very good. So again, I would encourage anybody to look at PubMed, look at up-to-date research and metadata. A lot of these treatments are starting to be approved by the Food and Drug Administration, uh, which is the entity that really holds research and studies back from being done in the States. Um, so a lot of the research that we see at the Academy of Laser Dentistry comes from all across the world, Russia, Europe, and, and even uh, Indian and Korea. Um, so as we move forward, we look at the research, we look at the, the potential uh, income potential there. And we want to, if we decide to move forward with laser, it is important that we establish a system, a clinical system or protocol of properly presenting the benefits and advantages to these patients, because usually they are fee for service. Most, pay, most practices do charge for these therapies and rightfully so. So it's up to me as your, as your um, team member to be able to understand what type of dentistry you wanna do and how to set you up and really educate the patients um, for to move forward with those treatments. So we work on a, on a team approach with our assessment, um, our identification on the doctor's second set of eyes. And when we do diagnose therapy, we present the benefit or the expected treatment outcome first before we present the patient with a cost. So again, as it pertains to laser periotherapy, I want to really go back to where I began. And in our practice, the paradigm was, I've had gum disease. Um, I only come in when my gums hurt or people were still coming in just for palliative purposes. And we saw a lot of patients, of course, um, that were coming in on a routine basis. But I did notice that some patients were not quite invested or they didn't really understand what gum disease truly meant. So again, these treatments are never one and done. We do want the patient to understand fully what gum disease means and how it is a chronic inflammatory degenerative condition. It causes clinical attachment loss and how lasers can be a regenerative or uh, a therapeutic to counteract the, the destruction of, of chronic periodontitis. So again, you want to really create a system of how you're going to roll this out for your patients so they understand the laser becomes a standard of care protocol at every visit, usually every time they come in. So as we wrap up, I'd love for you to consider which laser therapies might you be interested in incorporating into your practice? Where might this fit into your model of dental care? And if so, which type of uh, training do you think your, your team would, in, would prefer to have? There are several different ways uh, to, to get laser training. And this is from the a curriculum guideline and standard of laser education, which is adopted globally. So when you take a training course and you're wondering what all it entails, you go through a history, the physics and the fundamentals of laser. You learn laser as a device, it's mechanics. How do you load it? How do you set it? So all the technicalities and tactical side of it. And then you look at what a restorative dental procedures and what preventative hygiene treatments can be done based on the type of laser you're using. And then of course you look at safety parameters and practice management items. This is a really good time for us to incorporate laser therapy. So again, as I started to shift that paradigm in my in my practice with laser, as we started to introduce it to everybody, I found that patients then, and this was, mind you, 10 years ago, almost a decade ago, they were not aware of the oral microbiome in their mouth. Now, as we've gone through this pandemic, patients are now masked up. They understand that if they sneeze or cough, 
bacteria, contagious bacteria or virus can uh, emit into the air and it's on our hand, bacteria is on our hands and we can spread it by touch, right? So it's a very good time to open up the conversation of offering patients um, antiseptic treatment that's holistic and homeopathic, such as topical laser therapy. So as I was preparing for this talk, I started to look at what is the what is the current model of preventative hygiene and hygiene therapeutics um, in your country? And this is just a rough list from the IFDH. I'm sure there's much more to add. So if we have any hygienists here or any doctors, I would love to hear from you. I'd love to know more about how uh, you're working with in tandem with your hygienist or doctor to, to perform these, uh, to, to perform our work, our, the amazing work that we do. I did come across an article by Mrs. Kim. She's a global hygienist and she wrote in her article that she studied in Korea. She worked in Korea, South Korea. She worked in Canada performing all types of treatments. So again, I'd love to see how you are working together and I'd like to invite us to really come together and establish a, a new level of care for patients, not just as it pertains to laser, but as it pertains to all of the technology that we have available to us. Thank you again. I appreciate you so much. I hope you enjoyed our time together. And I hope for the opportunity to come back and present again on other realms and aspects of therapy. So for today, this is non-malignant uses of treatment of pain therapy and non-surgical periotherapy. Again, we could go on and on, but I just wanted to give you guys a high level overview of, the, of a couple of the benefits that you can utilize to start shifting uh, the way we treat patients. Please reach out to me if you have any questions and thank you so much for watching.